You're listening to Walk It Out with Trisha Goyer, where we discover what it looks like to follow God and be swept away on the journey of a lifetime. Author of over 70 books, mom of 10, yes, 10, homeschooler and speaker, Trisha Goyer will explore what radical obedience to God's word looks like. It's time to hear from God lovers who've dared to say yes. Listen in to Heart to Heart Chats and learn how others overcame doubts and fears. Discover how God used ordinary people to impact others one step at a time. If you're ready to get radical, get going, and make a difference in this world, you're at the right place. Here's your host, prolific writer, world traveler, people lover, and mega nap taker, Trisha Goyer. Hey friends, well today on Walk It Out, I'm chatting with my friend Amber Leah, and we're going to be talking about the new book that she wrote with her husband Guy, Marriage Triggers. Marriage Triggers walks you through 31 of the most common marital issues that sabotage great relationships. Guy and Amber have been married for over 14 years, and they will be the first to tell you they are just a typical couple that want you to thrive in your marriage. In the book, they share tips for countering negative reactions to triggers with gentle biblical responses. They're also co-producers and owners of their faith and family production company, Storehouse Media Group. So welcome, Amber. Thanks, Trisha. It's always a good thing when I get to talk with you, so I'm excited Uh to be here. Yeah, it's so fun chatting, and we're both managing working at home and kids at home and all the things that are going on right now. Exactly. All the many, many things that a lot of people can relate to. Yes. (laughs) Working from home, kids at home, homeschooling when you didn't think you were ever going to homeschool, all of those things. (laughs) Yeah, and, I mean, because a lot of families have both moms and dads trying to work from home and balance everything, I can imagine there might be a lot of triggering going on right now. For sure. Absolutely. I think that's 100% true. And that's what I'm hearing definitely through the grapevine. (laughs) People are struggling. So let's just jump in and start talking about the book because um, I think it's so important. And I know that you have a book, um, Triggers, that talks about, you know, parenting. Why did you decide that you wanted to approach this in marriage too? Well, one of the things that I discovered when I went all around, you know, the country speaking and just talking with readers, letters I would get from readers is they would say things like, look, the parenting books have been tremendous in helping me with my kids. And I've actually been able to apply quite a bit of that in other relationships too. But we often would get requests that say, we just really need something for our marriages. That's another area of struggle. And we would love specific things that we can address um, with our husbands, with our wives. And so I didn't really want to write this book, to be honest. And it took me a number of years um, from the time God really started putting it on my heart to when I began to research and gather information and pray through it before we felt like the timing was right. And so that's initially how Marriage Triggers was born. And then we also decided, you know, we'll, we'll just, we'll put it out to publishers. And if it's really what we're meant to do, if this is truly a need and, and God wants Guy and I to partner together, my own husband in writing this book, then um, he'll make a way. And he very clearly did. So that's how Marriage Triggers was born. And it's been a blessing for us in our own marriage to write the book together Uh, Although we joke that writing a marriage triggers book is in and of itself a marriage trigger. (laughs) (laughs) Why did you write that? Why would you say that about me? How come you shared that story? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And even just, you know, collaborating with somebody else on a project is always, I think, challenging. Um, And we did a, a pretty good job of communicating together and working together. But it was still, um, you know, obstacles to be had. But at the same time, writing the book helped us. And that's one of the things that Guy and I, it's important for readers to know is that we're not necessarily coming at you as doctors um, in a specialty in this area. We really are just an average couple that loves God and um, wants to help others and is hoping that our transparency and the things that we share from others and, and their journeys and their stories um, will be really relatable because we're on the same journey through these triggers, just like everybody else. Yeah. And actually, that's what I was had for my next talking point, because you guys are writing this and you're still in the parenting years. You have four little guys at home. I mean, you know, from toddlers to preteens, all the yes. steps. And I think sometimes 
I know when I pick up a book, if it's written by someone who all their kids are out of the house and, you know, they're both semi-retired and they're going on RV trips and whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's a totally different season of life. And, I, you know, we were almost there. We were almost empty nesters before we decided to adopt seven more kids. And so, I mean, it's different from someone who's kind of been there. And, yes, we do want to look to you know, older people that have been there for advice, but it also is so helpful to hear from someone who is in the middle of it, who is still dealing with this and sometimes being triggered and triggering their spouses because that's where, you know, most of us are. We're right there in the middle of it with our own kids, with our own spouses. And then you add in, you know, world crisis on top of it and and it can, it, it just makes it very applicable to today. Absolutely. Yeah. That's our prayer. All right, so um, let's talk about trigger moments and just um, in general, what does that word mean and how do you think it applies to marriage? Okay, great question. We think this is something that a lot of couples overlook. Mm -hmm. If you think for a minute about the times when you and your spouse have your biggest arguments or just the kind of argument that happens on repetition. Like we always have um, a particular argument um, over finances. And we've come to realize we're always talking about finances late at night after the kids are in bed and we're both tired, we're both exhausted, and then we're easily irritated by each other, plus the stress of talking about money. And that's when we're always having our biggest arguments. Well, that's a signal right there that that's a trigger moment. Um, It could be the issue itself, but also it's the time of day that you're choosing to talk about these things. We don't think it's a good idea to hash out important topics or topics that you tend to disagree on um, at times like that, those trigger moments late at night when you're both exhausted. For some people, they end up starting um, these conversations that can trigger them in some place like in the car when you're both confined and and one spouse feels sort of trapped in the conversation. And so if you discover, hey, we're always getting in arguments in the car, it could be that one of you is a backseat driver, which we talk about in one of our (laughs) chapters, and that's the trigger itself. But sometimes it's just the place or the time when you start a conversation about a particular issue that can be in and of itself a trigger. And so we think it's healthy to think about that and start noticing if there's a pattern for these trigger moments. And then you should come together and say, hey, this is bad timing for us, these trigger moments. Let's commit that I'm not going to start a heavy topic with you in the car because then we're in front of the kids. We feel trapped. It, it spirals out of control. Or I know we like to talk about finances late at night, but we're both tired. It doesn't usually go well. Let's come up with a better plan of a time and a place where we can talk about these issues and do so in a way where we're both feeling um, in a good headspace and we're able to talk about these things in a way that's not going to add to the problem. Yeah, that is such a good thing. I know most of the arguments John and I get into, it's when one of us is tired. And then yeah. it seems like, I mean, little things that are just little things that we can ignore when you're tired and you've been with kids all day, it's like, oh, why did you say that in that way? Or that was rude. And that the other person might not be meaning to be rude, but we just take it that way because we're like at the end of our rope and we're tired and, um, you know, we just need some space. And I think so many times, I love how you talked about too, um, you know, don't, you know, right before bed or something, get into these yeah. big conversations <laughs> right. that you know are, are not going to be able to be resolved um, during that time. And one thing that I found that really works for us is I'll just say, you know, and just messaging back and forth. We both work at home, but, you know, my husband's usually in his office all day. So I'll just like, hey, I really need to talk to you about um, one of the teen girls in their school assignments. Um, can we do that sometime later? And so it just lets him know that there's something I need to talk about or something that's going on that when it's a good time, and it might not even be that night or it might be the next morning or something, but I know that he knows I want to talk about something and we're both get a chance to kind of think about it um, and what's going on or, you know, whatever it is that we can start preparing for the talk instead of it being 1030 at night and someone bringing it up and the other person really just wants to go to bed and doesn't want to think about it at that time. 
And that's really important, Tricia, because our personalities are really different in our marriage relationships very often. That's true mm-hmm. for Guy and I. It's another one of the chapters in the book is when your personalities are different. But giving my husband, because I understand his personality, he does need some lead up time to think through a topic before we discuss it. I'm kind of ready to think on my feet and he's more of a processor. So when you go to your husband, John, and you say, hey, let's talk about this later, you give him a heads up. It's a really loving thing to do because your your conversation when you do come together is going to be much more fruitful because he's had time to process and think it through and even pray about it, which right. is another thing that we think couples don't do often enough is pray about these times of communication when we're discussing issues. And so it's just a really um, lots of of benefits to doing something like that and not a lot of negatives. So that's, that's awesome that you guys do that too. Yeah. And I know you, you have cover um, 31 different like topics, but what do you think are some of the most common um, trigger moments? You mentioned finances, which probably is probably pretty close to the top of the list of everyone, but what are some other like triggers that really get people um, it's hard for them to communicate about? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think communication in general is one of the biggest ones, broken communication. Mm -hmm. And that can take a number of different forms. You know, there's different ways that we experience broken communication. I think it's important to remember, like if you feel really frustrated at the get-go, thinking about having a conversation with your spouse um, over any kind of issue that you're dealing with, then I think one of the first things to remember is just to sort of shift your perspective and and recognize that broken communication happens because you've probably got fairly broken people and broken Mm -hmm. people that are going to naturally tend towards broken communication. But when we recognize that we all have our flaws, we all have some measure of, of brokenness or failure or inability to communicate correctly in one way or another, it allows us to extend grace to our spouse. Um, I tend to be really um, like almost like a lawyer in my conversations with my husband where I'm like, okay, here's A plus B equals C. Things tend to be very, very black and white. And I don't give a lot of room for my husband to communicate in his style. I want him to be quick to answer and you know, find a solution. And that comes even just from um, my background of things not being really stable and clearly communicated and, and a lot of um, kind of chaotic environment growing up. And so I like mm. things to just be very clear and very stable. And I want to solve a problem right now because that gives me a sense of security. And for a long time, Guy would look at that style of communication because of just my background and my personality, and he would feel really threatened by it and kind of steamrolled. And when he started to look at me as, hey, you know, this is actually a way I get to love Amber is understanding that about her and giving her grace for that and not taking it personally. And then really loving me and allowing me to communicate the way I communicate um, and even help me to communicate a little bit differently. But if he had just always been defensive toward that and critical of me instead of being grace, gracious toward me and understanding toward me, we wouldn't have been able to work through some of these broken communication styles that we, that we had. And so I do think that understanding that um, broken people obviously are going to demonstrate, um, you know, maybe ineffective or poor ways of communicating at times, but understanding that opens our hearts up to demonstrating that grace toward our spouses and believing the best about them when it comes to communication. Oh, that's so good. And I like how you brought up kind of the foundation, almost where we came from can really impact our communication style. And I know um, John is very quick on his feet and he can out talk me 100% of the time. Like he can uh-huh. just, he knows, and, and, and most of the time he's probably right too. So there's that yeah. issue. Um, but the, the interesting thing is, every time he would bring something up that maybe wasn't even a huge conflict because of issues of abandonment in my past where I didn't know my biological dad, my stepdad was very distant. Mm -hmm. Boyfriends have left me and abandoned me anytime he would just uh, start to maybe have a disagreement about anything. I was feeling threatened 
abandoned and then wanting to push back and run. Like, I just need to get out of here. I can't even talk about this. And then he's out talking to me as I'm feeling like I need to escape. (laughs) So this is not a good thing. And it came to both two things where, first of all, he had to realize, like, he doesn't need to out talk me. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. second, Mm -hmm. I need to realize I can trust that um, just because there's an issue that we need to talk about, John is not going to abandon me. I mean, we've been married 30 years now, but it took probably, oh, 15 for me to like feel confident in that, that just because we're having a disagreement now, I'm not going to be abandoned in this. And so all those issues of the past, that baggage that we carry do often impact a lot about that communication and the, even those triggers. And then when you get the two together, you know, bad communication and being triggered because of emotions from the past. Um, it can lead and we, we see there's so many divorces and it's really just we don't know how to communicate and we have these hurts that we don't know what yeah. to do with either. And, and you you really hit the nail on the head for one of the essences of this book, Trisha, is just as far as understanding our one of the purposes of our marriage is that it took you guys 15 years to figure out those patterns. It took Guy and I many years to figure out our patterns. And I hope that alone gives people some hope and understanding that these are things that people do have to work through, maybe for a long time. But the essence of the point of all of that is that one of God's designs, I we believe, for marriage is that marriage is to be a place of healing for one mm-hmm. another. And so it's not just, oh, I love you, you love me, let's get married and everything's great. Marriage is really about our refinement. It's about our spiritual growth. And it is a place for us to heal. And not only that, when my communication style was fairly broken and um, aggressive and ineffective toward Guy, that was an opportunity for Guy to love me like I had never been loved before. Mm -hmm. And for him to bless my life and for him to demonstrate the love of Jesus for the church in the way that he loved me, his bride. And so it, it's a beautiful thing when we look at these triggers, not just as, oh, problems we've got, we got to figure this out, but these are actually opportunities for you to heal and for you to be a vehicle for healing for your spouse. And when we yeah. look at it like that, it just gives an incredible um, you know, purpose to these triggers and some really, I think, meaningful value. Yeah, that is so good. I love that, that it is a place of healing. And I, I do feel our marriage has been a place where I, because I'm able to trust John more, I'm able to trust God more and trust, right. you know, and, and see how God, you know, even though there was those broken places in my life, God has brought so much healing to my heart, just of that, you know, that pain childhood. And I love that, that marriage is supposed to be like that. And it, it can be like that. But man, sometimes we get yeah. in the way um, and, and just we, we struggle because it is, it's broken people coming together and trying to, um, you know, form something that is really difficult in today's world. Yeah. And I'd just like to say to a little bit more on this topic of communication, because sometimes broken communication doesn't just come from what we say that can be hurtful, but it's also comes from what we don't say. We can have broken mm. communication because we're not being proactive or intentional to communicate um, positive things towards our spouses. And so this is just a simple thing anybody could do to start with is just to start shifting our focus. Okay, we get so caught up in these arguments all the time or these disagreements or we feel triggered and we clam up. Maybe we're not even talking to each other. But if we can start also flipping that a little bit and start thinking about what's one or two things I could be intentional to communicate that's positive, that will bless my spouse. You know, Matthew 15, 18 says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. So if we're always saying things that are negative or that cause fights or arguments, or we're misunderstanding our spouse all the time, that can be really draining. It can just suck the joy out of our marriage. So if we can start to just even simply think, hey, you know what, I'm going to focus on, you know, the Bible tells us, dwell on what is true and pure and lovely and of good report. If I, and this was one of the things that God started working in me when I knew that I needed the Lord to transform me before he would start transforming my marriage. And that is that I started really focusing on the things I was thankful for about my spouse. Mm -hmm. And at first it was hard for me to even think about saying those things out loud toward Guy because we were in such a difficult place. But slowly but surely, as I began to even just jot some things down in a journal that I appreciated or that I should communicate toward my husband, 
it allowed me the headspace to then start coming to a point where I could verbalize those toward him. And the thing is, is that God's ability to work on my communication with my spouse and my attitude toward my spouse had nothing to do with Guy. It had everything to do with me and the Holy Spirit working on me. The beautiful byproduct was that it did have an impact on my husband and our relationship. But first and foremost, it was really about the Lord transforming me. So I would be purposeful every day to say one thing that I knew would bless and encourage my spouse, um, something that was affirming about him. And that really began to change the tone and the atmosphere in our home from one that felt often electric and triggered to a place of peace. Yeah. And I think there's so many things that we can, you know, get riled up about or upset about that when we really pause to think through it, maybe it is even our own fears, our own own stuff like you were talking about. Um, for example, you know, we are self quarantine right now and uh, my grandma's 90 and she lives with us. And one of our daughters has an autoimmune disease. And so John you know, multiple days in a row was going to the grocery stores and, and like the, after the third day, I'm like, you need to stop. Cause I'm like yeah. so concerned about <laughs> the germs that are going to yeah. be coming to my house. And I was, I spoke probably more harshly than I should have, but he just paused. He's like, okay, I won't go today. And then mm-hmm. later I'm able to, I was able to go to him and like, I'm sorry. I, I spoke in that tone, but I'm, I'm really concerned, but I do. I thank you. I know your concern is you just want to make sure we have what we need in the house for our family because we have a large family and it does take a lot to feed. So first of all, it was just me noting my concern. Um, I, I mean, it, it was in the wrong way. My concern for the health kind of lashed out at my husband. Um, but thankfully he was able to see that in me and just, you know, know that's where that was coming from. And we were able to talk about that later, but also just thanking him. Like, I know you are working so hard and it is not fun going out there and standing in line in grocery stores and all the things, you know, trying to get. So I just sort of appreciate the way you are taking care of us. And, um, but you know, it could have blown him up into a fight if he would have said, well, I'm going, you know, just pr- trying to provide yeah. for our family. I mean, it, but he just said, okay. And we were able to talk about that um, later when I was able to kind of get my emotions <laughs> under control yeah, about well, everything. John did exactly Proverbs 15, one, which is one of my favorite verses on the topic of anger. It, a soft answer turns mm-hmm. away wrath, but a harsh yeah. word stirs up anger. And, and that is one of the, again, a simple, immediate thing we can all put into practice is having that, that response like John did, where he just said, okay, you know, he just was gentle about it. He was soft about it kept it short and sweet. And then you could maybe talk about it further when both of you um, are outside of conflict, when emotions are not high anymore. But just having that soft answer, it does turn away wrath as opposed to like you said, Trisha, just fighting fire with fire. That doesn't get us anywhere. You know, one of you has to be the one to drop the rope, as my friend Wendy Speak likes to say. If you're in this tug of war and you're both tugging back and forth and back and forth and it's going nowhere quick, then the, one of the best things you can do is just you decide to be the one to drop that rope. You decide mm-hmm. to be the one to have that soft answer. And that's going to really dissipate that argument, hopefully very quickly. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I do want to talk about, there are times though, when we have a right to be angry, <laughs> um, there are things that our spouse might um, do that are hurtful or sinful even. And you even, um, there's this quote that you have from Lou Prilly. I don't know Priello. how to pronounce this last yeah, time. Lou Priello. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if your anger is due to your recognition that a holy God has been offended by another's behavior, that anger is a righteous. On the other hand, if your anger is a result of not having your personal desires met, that anger is sinful. And so there are times when our anger is definitely sinful because our personal desires aren't met. Our spouse, we don't feel is doing what we want them to do. But then there's those times when someone's behavior has offended us, has hurt us. Maybe they are acting in sin. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. I'm just going to toss it over to you to go wherever you want yeah, with that. It, it's a difficult topic. And when I first started studying about anger, the differences between righteous anger and unrighteous anger, this was difficult for me to process and accept at first. But now that I've been examining it for many years now, I've just seen the fruit of this um, in my life and in many, many other people's lives. And it's when you do understand that, look, when we get righteously angry, righteous anger is really this idea that our, whether it's our child, 
or our spouse or anybody in the world, when they sin, when they do something that's wrong, we should feel angry about that, Mm -hmm. but not because they've offended us. Really, it's because we should grieve that a holy God has been sinned against. They're really not sinning against us per se. The, the thing that they're violating, the, the being that they're violating is really God because it's his law and it, he's the author of all that is good and right and true. So we should grieve when we see sin. I mean, it's sort of this idea of hate the sin, but love the sinner, right? And the problem is often we misplace our anger and we direct it toward the person that we're angry at, our spouse or our child when really that anger should be placed and directed toward our enemy, Satan. He's the one that's tempting us. He's the one that's the source of all evil. God is the source of all good. And so when we are sinned against, it's difficult to not make it feel personal. I -hmm. realize that. And we do often um, feel wounded by the sin of others. And it's true. Other people's sin does affect us and impact us. But if we can get to a place of spiritual growth where we care more that they've sinned against God than that they've sinned against us, it really removes a lot of the angst and the anger from these situations because we don't have to take it personally. When I look at my husband's sin, I can detach myself from it in a sense. And I can say, you know what? He's a sinner just like me. I I am no better than him. And we both are an offense to God many times. The good Mm -hmm. news is, is that there is therefore now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ. God removed all the guilt of that sin, both from him and from me. So if God has already forgiven Guy, and if God has already forgiven me, then we're in no place to hold anything against one another. And that's why I think it's important to remember you know, the context of Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, which says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Because if we start holding grudges against each other and making our anger unrighteous in that sense, it leads often to even more sinful situations because we're giving Satan an opportunity now to cause bitterness. Um, If we do start retorting with other angry words, Um, yelling at somebody, you know, resorting to foul language, all of those kinds of things. We're just snowballing um, a bigger and bigger issue into more and more sin, giving Satan an opportunity. So it's really important to recognize that, yeah, we're going to get angry. There is righteous and unrighteous anger. And to really examine, why are we so upset about this situation? Do I really need to take this so personally? And can I grow spiritually to the point where I'm more in love with and concerned about God and the sin of the world, my spouse's sin, my sin, being an affront to him, as opposed to taking it personally and feeling like a victim. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful thing when someone is able to um, come to their spouse's sin with that heart and that tenderness. Um, And I've even witnessed that, you know, times I've super messed up and John's been just so tender with me. It has just been a wonderful example, but even in our life, um, our oldest son, his uh, wife left him. They're now divorced. He's remarried to this wonderful girl. But, you know, even as as they were going through that conflict, I wanted to be angry at her. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, my son's just like, no, we just got to love her. Like, this wow. is between her and God. Mm-hmm. Like, she's mm-hmm. she's um, hurting him. You know, she's hurting the relationship with him right now. And, um it, just seeing his tenderness to it. And because I didn't go angry and go off on somebody and <laughs> try to yeah. like, do you know what you're doing to my son? I mean, um, right. because I, that his tenderness helped me to stay tender, even though they're divorced. Yeah. Now we have a good relationship. You know, the kids yeah. have their parents that are still able to connect and we're still able to connect with her. And, you know, their marriage didn't turn out like we wanted them to, but the tenderness there really helped it can the relationship continue in in yeah. a different way um and so that is so like we don't want marriage to end in divorce but when we realize that um ultimately we still need to love that person and we can be tender and like you said we all of us have messed up all of us have made mistakes 
Um, but love can go a long way even to bring healing to very hurt places. Yeah, and, and, and grace as well, because I talk about that in the book. I say justice doesn't always offer healing, but godly grace always does. Mm. So we may want justice. We may want people to answer for what they've done. We may want to hold people accountable to everything they've done that's hurt us or that's offended God. But that doesn't always bring healing. But when we offer that godly grace like your son did, um, it has a ripple effect that I think goes into eternity. And that brings a lot of healing. Oh, I love that so much. There are so many things we could talk about. Um, I, do, I want to just go through quickly and, and ex- share some of the things um, that people can can expect in the chapters. Because I think, I mean, there's like we could talk each day on each of these I mean each yeah we could talk over each of these chapters um but I just wanted to go over some of the topics so people know like there this covers a lot you know when the house is a mess and when you're married to a backseat driver when finances cause you to clash when life gets too busy um I don't see a chapter on when you face a pandemic in here Amber though (laughs) That would have been good. But I mean, I did not think of that one. (laughs) You did not think of that one. But I mean, there's there's so much more when your marriage ebbs and flows. You talk about in that chapter about unexpected things happening. Um, You know, there's so many different topics when past wounds surface, when your feelings are hurt. So just know that, I mean, we could definitely talk over each one of these things. But thankfully, it's all in a book that people can go and get. And I love. Um, just even the subtitles too, exchanging spouses, angry reactions for gentle biblical responses. And I love, I mean, you've even brought it up as we're talking today, you know, scripture, God's word is truth and it can apply in so many areas and in every chapter, um, God's truth just shines. It's not like you guys are just figuring out, well, this might work and this might work. No, it's going back and it's really basing those responses um, on God's truth, which is that that's what makes it so powerful. Yeah. You know, God has all the answers to all mm-hmm. of our marriage problems. He really does. He has all the answers. He's the author of life. There's nothing that is outside of his understanding or ability to help us. And we hope that comes through in each of these chapters that we want to be really, really sensitive and caring because we know there's a lot of hurting couples out there. We're yeah. very sensitive to that. We want to give you very specific encouragement straight from the word of God and then some very practical and simple things that you can do that we have seen make a big difference even within a day or two of starting to apply some of these principles. And that's really our prayer and our hope is that anybody who reads it will come away um, encouraged, strengthened, and that they will begin to even very quickly see a difference in their marriage. Yeah, so good. I love it. I'm so... um... I'm just so thankful that you guys just, you know, together stood before God and have even shared your mistakes, your hurts, your pain, and then how God has transformed that to give hope to others. That's what people need. They need hope. Yeah. They need yeah, encouragement. They and I'm and thankful that you guys <laughs> did that. No. Yeah. It's not, <laughs> it's not easy, easy, but, but we, we, you'll get no judgment from us because we right. share all of our issues in there. And so we're, we're a safe place for people to, to come to um, for insight and advice because uh, we've been there and done that and we sympathize. So Awesome. Yeah. So I highly recommend people get in the book. And where else can they connect with you online? So they can connect with me on Instagram, on my author page, on Facebook, Amber Leah, my blog, Mother of Nights, because I have four little boys, my little knights. And they're adorable. And then, yeah, <laughs> thank you. And then I also have a website with some of my books and some teaching videos at amberandwendy.com. And if you're interested in gentle parenting practices related to um, getting over some of our parenting triggers, my co-author, Wendy Speak, and I have a Facebook group called Gentle Parenting with Amber and Wendy. And our books are available everywhere books are sold. Awesome. And I heard um, that Barnes & Noble is do- even doing like side pickup, book side pickup. So <laughs> if you have a Barnes & Noble in town and don't want to yes. wait until it gets shipped, you could call and order it and they could... Uh, meet you outside and hand you your book. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. I didn't even so, know, but that's amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Amber, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all the ways that you just encourage us. You're welcome, Trisha. It's such a pleasure to be here. I hope all your listeners will be blessed and encouraged by our conversation. I know I am. Oh, thank you. 
Okay, friends, if ever there was a time when our marriage would be triggered, it was now. I think this is a perfect time. I'm so thankful for the chance to talk to Amber and I know Guy, too. Amazing couple. And I'm so thankful that they are speaking into our hearts. I see on a uh, social media and Facebook, people that are talking about like, do you find yourself just getting in these little arguments and um, being triggered? And I think so many times when we are in the larger crisis, which all of us have been um, in these recent months, that the buildup of the anxiety and tension and worry, we often take it out on those who we love the most and who we are closest to. And I have found that to be true too. Um, sometimes the worries of everything that's been going on in the world c- come into my heart and then um, go outwardly to my spouse in not so kind and gentle ways. So definitely this is a good time to pick up marriage triggers. Maybe you haven't had the time to sit down and read the Bible or read through books um, with your spouse. Now you might have more time. I know that's not true for everybody sometimes. Um, Even now there are spouses that are traveling and working and in healthcare and um, having a, a difficult time. But Again, this is a book that we can turn to, we can look at, we can use to build our relationship, to think about some of the things maybe that trigger us that we haven't really had time to deal with or think about, but now we have either more time or a more incentive as we are um, dealing with all these issues that are going on in the world. So today's Walk It Out verse is Ephesians 4, 2 through, two through 3. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourself together with peace. And I love that. Be humble, be gentle, be patient, make allowance for each other's faults, all because of love. Uh, Make an effort to keep united in the spirit and bind yourselves together with peace. So many good Um, just encouragements today. So let me just pray for us. Dear Lord, there is so much going on. And sometimes uh, when we have those worries and those fears, instead of looking to you for strength and hope, we let those worries and fears build up and we end up um, maybe lashing out or speaking unkindly, not being gentle with those um, in our home, especially our spouses, Lord. And I have been guilty of this. So forgive me of that, Lord. And I pray that you'll help me be more humble and gentle, patient, making allowance um, with my husband, Lord. And I pray for those listeners out there too, that they also will make more of an effort to keep themselves united with you in the spirit, united with their spouse in the spirit, so that this time really can be used um, for us to come together and to support each other, especially in marriage, Lord. I thank you so much for Guy and Amber And just being real and vulnerable about the issues in their marriage and how other people can just turn to you and find hope in you and dig through those triggers. I think sometimes we try to manage outward actions instead of really digging in to the deeper issues. And I pray that whatever pain or hurt or baggage or struggles, um, that those things will come out so that we can be united in the spirit with you and with each other in our marriages. Lord, I pray that you will bless Amber and Guy in their homes and their lives and their ministry and with their kids. I pray this book will be able to just encourage and strengthen people during this time, Lord. And I thank you so much um, for those who do have strong marriages. And I really pray, maybe someone is listening, Lord, who's really struggling right now. I just pray for that marriage, Lord. I pray um, that you will just um, soften hearts, Lord, and re- um, ignite love, maybe where it has just gone out, Lord. And I know that you can do this, Lord. Um, I thank you so much for the listeners. I thank you so much for this ministry and this opportunity to just introduce my friends, old and new, to the listeners and that they may be encouraged. I pray for each one today. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, friend, thank you so much for tuning in. Always, you can find out all the show notes, all the information, everything we talked about over at walkitoutpodcast.com. Be sure to share with a friend. Also, I don't mention this very much, but I've written a lot of books. 
and I've had a lot of blogs on marriage. So if you just go to trishagoyer.com, I have a lot of resources and more blogs on marriage and relationships and forgiveness and confession, all the things. So be sure to go over at trishagoyer.com um, and look for those. You can also check out the books. Maybe you need a novel to read during this time. Um, also, a great book um, that would be good for your kids is my book, Prayers That Changed History. Now that is, um, I'm working on the reprint right now, but there are some copies available on Amazon and other places. Um, and I hope that will encourage you. Again, this is a time we can really focus on those relationships close to us. We can um, have that time to read and to build up our own, um, just fill ourselves up during this time instead of our busy rushing lives before pouring out and maybe you have a little more time to read so be sure to check out all those resources over at trishagoyer.com again thank you so much for listening and i pray that you may be encouraged thanks for listening to walk it out head over to the show notes for this podcast and all past episodes at www.walkitoutpodcast.com if you love the show share it with someone you know who can make a radical difference in the world we love new friends See you next time.